Welcome to the Desire to Trade podcast, the podcast helping you develop forex trading skills for more freedom. I'm your host, Ethan Kreit. We are in episode 121. Let's get started right away. Earlier this year, I had the chance to visit Indonesia and I had the chance to meet great people there. One thing I realized though pretty quickly is that many brokers are actually blocked in Indonesia, which makes it very hard to trade, especially Forex. One thing I realized that was pretty interesting is that there was a lot of traders in Jakarta and that was a little bit surprising. I know some of the students in the Desire to Trade Academy actually live in Jakarta, but I've had the chance to meet other traders recently and one of them was recommended to me by a previous guest of the podcast, Argento Sunoto is a forex trader living in Jakarta. He was willing to come on a podcast to share stories and everything he went through. It's always interesting to see stories of different people with different backgrounds in different cities, and they all go through pretty much the same thing. Although they all have their version of dealing with adversity and getting the results that they want, which is in that case trading full time. Argento also shared about why he created a trading copier service and a little bit of the background as to what you need to prepare if you want to be able to do that too, which is an additional source of income. So without further ado, we'll jump right in the interview. Please help me welcome Argento Sunoto. Argento Sunoto, welcome on the podcast. How's it going today? I'm doing good, Etienne. Super happy to have you here straight from Jakarta, Indonesia. That's really cool. I think you're my first guest from Indonesia on the podcast, which is really awesome. Wow. Tell us what's going on these days a little bit for you. These days, I'm just trading Forex market. I'm a full-time trader, so I usually uh, swing trade Forex market. I trade stocks too, but um, most of them are just for my investments. Cool, cool. And you were referred to me by another previous guest of the podcast. What I'm curious about now is how did you start to trade exactly? So how was that time when you first got involved into trading? I started in stocks markets right after in 2009, right after the subprime uh, mortgage crisis. So at that time, um, I just moved back to Indonesia. So I was looking at the news on TV about the markets, how they crash and everything. And then some of my friends were telling me you could get really good price for some of the blue chip stocks. So I just bought some blue chip stocks, you know, without even knowing what I'm doing, actually. So I just bought like uh, what people were saying was really good. So I bought and then like after a couple of years, my investment went up really fast. And that's why I was interested in trading. So I started exploring technical analysis for trading and everything. And then in 2011, a friend of mine introduced me to Forex market, uh, which I found even more interesting than stock markets because it's open 24 hours a day. So I started trading Forex after that. And then after that, I decided to trade full time in 2011, at the end of 2011. And I've been trading full time for in Forex market since then. Wow, it's pretty impressive. And one of the reasons why I decided to stick to Forex myself is especially for, like you said, the time zone thing. So whenever I want to travel or go somewhere else, it's kind of hard to trade stocks in the US if you're going to travel and be in different time zones. So for you, I think it's pretty easy if you are in Jakarta yeah, to that's right. trade. Now, you're telling me that you are doing swing trading, which is interesting. So I want to get a little bit to your methodology and kind of how you trade exactly. So do you have any specific style or strategies you use? Yes, I mostly use Elliott Wave for my trading. So I um, learned Elliott Wave back in 2010. So a friend of mine introduced it to me because I was reading about Elliott Waves and I didn't understand when people were, take, were talking about wave three or, or wave four, you know. So a friend told me like a course that I could take and then I started taking them. And I found it really interesting, you know, because um, Elliott Wave kind of gave me a, like a roadmap for me to trade, which gave me like a bias for my trading. So having the roadmap, it's good for me. It's mostly um, leads me to um, like pretty good trading. Cool. That's interesting. And I'm not very familiar with Elliott Wave. But I know a lot of people trying to study them right now and they're not really sure like what are they do things right because I know it's kind of maybe hard in the beginning to identify the, the zones and the, the waves you trade. So how long did you spend studying those waves and what would you recommend people who want to learn to trade Elliott waves? It took me a good three to four years to really master wow. um, Elliott waves. Yeah, even, not even mastering, you know, like kind of understand how to apply it and everything. 
I mean, Joy putting up numbers, like telling you, you this is wave one, two, three, four, that's easy, but how to use it really, like really, really use it, it took me like a good three to four years. My suggestion for somebody who wants to learn about Elliott Wave is um, just study the basic technical analysis first and really understand it. Because um, Elliott Wave itself um, uh, are more easily understand if you're provision in uh, basic technical, because we, we use some of the basic technical stuff too, like uh, the basic uh, the basic chart patterns and then the Fibonacci retracement and extensions. So after that, it should be pretty good. I mean, it's pretty easy for you to learn Elliott Wave. Mm -hmm. Cool, wonderful. I'm curious to know, what does a day in your life look like? Because obviously if you swing trade, you're not going to be trading all day. So what do you do exactly like on a daily basis? To daily basis, so... Um, the thing I like about living in Indonesia is that actually I can trade like all the sessions, Asian, European, and American. So during the Asian season, Asian sessions, I'm not doing that much. You know, I'm just looking at my charts, like preparing for the market because they don't usually move unless you have like big news coming from Australia or Japan. So um, in the morning, I just usually look at my charts and then see if um, if any of my setup. It's being triggered or getting ready to trigger. And then um, during the European and American session, I just look if I have any entry that I could go on based on my setup. If not, then I don't do pretty much nothing, you know, because um, I'm trying to make money in the forex market. I'm not trying to make my broker rich. So <laughs> if I don't see any setup, then I don't do, I don't really do anything about it. So, but if I do have a setup, I usually enter it and then, um, after that, I just manage it carefully. So I move my stop loss and everything based on my setup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful. But pretty much I spend a lot of time with my family. So I usually sometimes drop off my kids at school or pick them up. And then that's pretty much it in my life. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good distinction to make. The fact that you don't there to trade, but you're there to make money. And a lot of people want to trade. So they place a lot of trades, but they end up not making money, which is kind of the wrong way to go about it. So I'm, I'm curious to know, because a lot of people doing swing trading, that's what they see as their day to be. Like they're going to look at the chart, place trades when they have to place trades. But what do you think separates you from all the other traders who don't really make money trading? Um, I think I'm just waiting for the right setup and um, I manage my risk. So, I mean, to be profitable in the market, you don't really have to trade every day or like even like a couple of times a day. I mean, even if with like good two to three trades a month, you can even make more money if, if uh, you get a really good setup with a really good reward ratio. So the thing is not, not trying to, try not to over trade, but just wait for the right setup to come to you. That way uh, you'll make more money and don't forget to manage your risk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think so instead, of think, yeah, instead of thinking about the profit you're going to make, you need to manage your risk first. Like how much money are you, are you ready to lose if you're wrong? Exactly. And speaking of kind of Elliott waves and the edge of testing the market, one thing that's probably hard to do with Elliott wave is you cannot really test it in a way like with a script. So you cannot back test it with a script. You have to test it manually. I'm curious to know, how did you kind of validate your edge in the market? Did you do some back testing? Did you try it out yourself or test a demo account for some time? How did that happen? I back tested myself actually. So um, based on my own experience, when I learned Elliott wave, um, you know, I traded a small account, and so I, I used my um, counts, the Elite Wave counts and everything, and then base it on my, but I used a really small lot size to test it. And then after a while, after I'm confident with my Elite Waves, how I count it and how to use it and everything, I just um, traded the big account after that. Mm -hmm. And how long did that take? Did that take like a month or a few months or a year? It took me a year to, uh, to, for me to be really confident about the, the results. Okay, cool, cool. That's pretty interesting. And what would be your advice for people who believe that kind of backtesting or testing things is tedious and they want to jump straight away to trading live with a big account? Because I'm, I'm I would, sure you see that like all the time, no? Yeah, I, I've seen that a couple of times actually. But the thing is uh, when you jump in the markets, like kind of like, you know, when you learn how to swim, you don't even know how to swim, but you, you jump, just jump into like the deep pool. 
uh, you might drown yourself. So I think it's better just to backtest it or even trade it with a, like a really small size to build up your confidence. By then, I mean, if you're confident about your edge and everything, you know, how you set up and everything, you'll be able to trade more calm. You're not going to be nervous every time you enter the market. Yeah, that's really right. And I can recognize that because the first two years that I traded, I didn't have anything back to say. I didn't have any proof of my result. And I was stressed like all the time. And then when I changed yeah. that to back testing and knowing the result, then like I felt much more confident and you know, clear when I was. When yeah, because mostly, so. pe- mostly people that I saw, like the new traders, they're so stressed out when, you know, when their accounts, like uh, like they, they have a drawdowns and everything. So they're really stressful. And then they're trying to make like a revenge trade to make up all the money they lost. And then in the end, they lost more money than, uh, than initially they have. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm curious to know, so apart from the trading strategy that you apply consistently in the market, what are some of the other things you do consistently? Do you have any habits that you think are essential for traders? Yeah, it is. I think the most important thing for traders is um, to fall in love with their charts, you know? You need to treat your charts like, like, a relation, like your relationship. I mean, <laughs> trading is kind of like a relationship. I mean, when, when you fall in love with somebody, right? You give them the, your full trust and everything. It's the same thing as trading. I mean, you need to fall in love with your charts. You just have to trust whatever the charts is telling you instead of listening to somebody else or looking at like the so-called expert or the guru. Just look at your own charts and then look what it's telling you. I mean, it's, everything is there. You just have to trust it. I mean, I love my family and all, but I like to be alone with my charts. I mean, I'm treating my charts as, you know, as, as I love my wife. So whatever the charts telling me that that's what I take, you know, the trades. Mm-hmm. And I see this like really interesting because it's, it's kind of trying to analyze and learn from the chart, which I think is the best way to learn. But it does take a lot of time to learn from your chart. That's really right. Oh, yeah. That's right. You need to spend a lot of screen time. I mean, you can't really buy experience. I mean, you have to go through it by yourself. And at the end, it's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have you developed some other strategies just by looking at the charts? Or what are some things that you've kind of got from looking at some charts and analyzing the market? Just by looking at the charts, you know, uh, it kind of gives me like a roadmap for my trading. So I know which direction I'm supposed to trade. But the thing is, even with a roadmap, the driver is the key, you know. You still need to navigate all the turns and hazards. It's the same thing as, as, the, as in trading. I mean, even though you know which direction your bias is, like if you're long the market or short the market, you still need to find the, the best entry that you can get. And then you need to put like a stop loss and then so you know when you're wrong. And then also the target where, where we're heading. The charts could give you all that. You just have to look at it and then listen to your charts. Mm-hmm. For sure, for sure. And I'm pretty sure as a trader that you find yourself in like tough situations sometimes where things don't go as you plan or things don't go really well, like you lost a few trades. Or How do you get back on track in those times? I just move on to the next one. That's the be- I think that's the, the, the advice I would give somebody. You know, The worst drawdown I have is like almost 10% of my account. I think it was like a few losses. I think it was like eight in a row, something like that. So, but the thing is with trading, you can't just moan about it or anything. You just have to move on to the next trade. I mean, if you have a loss or something, then you, it means there's something wrong. You just have to look back to the chart and then see what mistake did you make and then learn from it and then just move on to the next one. Just learn from your own mistake. And that's about it. Powerful. And I think a 10% drawdown is really good if you manage to, to get only that. <laughs> That's a really good, uh, it pretty much, like, that means you're managing risk properly. But the thing is, I've blown an account before when I started trading. Mm-hmm. But the, so the 10% is, um, is like uh, the last few years, that's the worst drawdowns. But in the beginning of my trading, I did blow up an account. You know, I did blow an account. So, and it was something that I learned, you know. Um, I learned to manage my risk, you know, instead of thinking about all the profits I could make. So that's why I only have um, small drawdowns now because um, I really risk like as small as I can. So I wouldn't be too worried about the drawdowns at the end. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's well said. And the other thing I'm curious about, and that's something I like about you, is that you're not only trading. So you're starting right now, I think, trading singles, right? 
So I'm, I'm curious to know what was the purpose of, of uh, offering signals? Uh, actually, it's not a trading signal. It's a trade copier service. Right. So um, I'm kind of active in, um, in Twitter right now. So I usually post my charts over there. And then I got a few messages from my followers asking me if um, I provide a forex service signal or uh, forex signals or something. And the thing is, I don't want to give a, just give out the signals. Because one thing um, with signals, right? Forex is open 24 hours, like I said earlier. So we have different time zones. Say I give you like a signal like early in the morning in Asia. I mean, for, for the followers in the US, they're still sleeping. So they won't be able to execute their signals. So when they do get the signals, it might be the losing ones, you know, if they don't execute all the trades. And then the second one is about the risk management. I mean, even though you're right, say you have a really good hit rate, but you're not managing your risk and then you're losing big on those losing trades. Uh, you're still not making profit out of it. That's why um, I decided to do a trade copier service instead. So I could give you the signals. The signals would be executed um, anytime, even though you're still sleeping. And then the second thing is the I could manage your, the risk for you too. So the drawdowns wouldn't be so bad. And then you won't be so stressed out looking at it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's why I started the, the trade copier service instead of the forex signals because i've seen um, like a couple of uh, service that just provide the signals and some of them were telling me you know i couldn't execute it because uh, they give it to me when i was sleeping or when i was um, going out something like that so with the trade copier it's more reliable because um, you'll copy all my trades instead of just some of them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah it's, it's pretty funny because i've seen people who buy like really expensive singles and they they still manage to fail and up account because exactly like, like you said, they don't manage this properly or they miss some of them or they think only like part of them. Like when they feel good about the single, they're going to take it. And when they don't feel good about it, they're not going to take it. So it's kind of exactly like, it's not. Yeah, it's not going to work for sure. Exactly. So that, that's a really good point. And the other thing that I want to talk about is you've probably seen this before. People who have like really weird expectation trading. They expect to make like millions in two weeks and... <laughs> It's possible you've been through that phase also. I've, I've been there myself in the beginning. But I wanted to talk about just a little bit about your return and kind of what people can expect from trading. I know you publish your return online. And do you have like any kind of expectation for yourself right now where you are or like a goal every month or no? Uh, yes. I, um, yeah, like you said, in the beginning, I was expecting you know, I had that weird expectation too. I was hoping to like double my accounts in like a month or so. Yeah. And that's why I ended up growing my account. But at the end, I, I kind of noticed, I kind of realized, you know, when you're managing your risk, it's not possible to have that kind of amazing returns. So that's why I kind of set the expectation um, kind of lower for myself. So now I'm just, when I trade, I'm, in, um, I'm risking only about 1% or less of my account. So my goal is about like, uh, say, like 2 to 3% a month. So anything more than that, I consider it as a bonus for myself, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and yeah and i was looking at your past performance in your blog and those are pretty consistent numbers it's not like you make 10 percent a month and like you lose a lot the next month it's like pretty much consistent which is uh, really good i like that yeah because um, i'm trying to manage the drawdowns because i don't really want to like i have a big drawdowns and then after they have a really big good month you know so i'm just trying uh, to wait for the right setup for me like I said earlier, I'm just here to make money. You know, I'm I'm trading to make money, so I'm I'm waiting for a good setup. Once I see a good setup, then I would just uh, I would place a trade on that, even though it's not fantastic returns, but it's consistent, and that's why I'm doing that. I mean, I'm doing this full time. It's not a hobby of mine. Uh, I support my family with this, right? So I need to make uh, money every month. If I don't make any profit, then you know I'm not getting money in. So that's why I try to be consistent instead of fantastic returns. Yeah, yeah. And that's a big distinction once again. I like that. So we'll put a link in the show notes if people want to see your uh, your result. One thing I'm curious also is what would you recommend people who want to start a copier service? Like what do they need to set up? What kind of track record do they need in your opinion? I mean, as long as they're showing um, like consistent results, uh, it's a pretty good start, you know, for a trade copier service. When you, uh, even for like for the other service too, I mean, as long as you're making consistent return, it's a good sell uh, from that, you know, because you don't want to have like a up and downs months. I mean, even though you're making profit at the end, but if you have like up and downs results, uh, 
people will be kind of shocked. Say you saw like a, a customer subscribe to you in the month that you have a really big drawdowns. They're going to be really kind of mad or something, you know, after that. So, I mean, uh, as for to start a copier service, I mean, like for myself, I want to give a consistent result. So even though I don't have a fantastic return, I know every month that my client was, would be getting a, a return at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really well said. And one thing I'm curious, so I just look at your statement on, uh, on, on your website. I see that you have some really big wins and some really small wins or small losses. So I'm curious to know what kind mm -hmm. of risk management techniques you use. You have like putting a stop loss to break even or are there some things you prefer over others? Yes. The trace I usually take has a, like at least one to two, sometimes uh, more than that, uh, mostly a one to three. So uh, when I see the trades moving my way, say it moves like 50 to 60 pips, I usually sometimes take profit, like partial profit, or I move my stop loss to break even, you know? So that kind of make me um, kind of like a free trade, so I don't really have to worry about it. I'm not, I'm not risking my capital. So that way I can um, stay in the trade longer to see that really big profits. But if not, then I'll just get out at break even, so I will really have a small loss or, or break even. Uh, if sometimes I I don't have a chance to move the stop loss, um, I'm only releasing uh, like a small amount of my capital. So that's why I, I only have a um, break even, a small loss, or just a, like a 1% loss of my account. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that is probably the thing that helped me the most to get to making money trading, basically. So when I started to implement kind of partial profit and moving stop loss to break even, that's where like first I, f I felt better in my trades. And second, I got more profit. So it's kind of a really good way That's to right. Do it. Yeah. Although I changed over time. No matter what. But yeah. Go ahead. No matter what, we still want to get paid, right? So that's why we take partials or, uh, you know, or just take the profit out, you know, instead of letting it run. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Is there any other advice you'd like to give traders in, in, in this podcast? Is there anything they need to know about trading that you would like to teach them? Not to teach them, but just kind of remind them, you know, just manage your risk. If you do decide to trade, uh, no matter who's trading your account, it's whether you copy somebody else if, or if it's your own idea, just make sure you know where you're wrong. So you know how to, where to place, place your stop loss and manage your risk. Because without risk management, no matter how good you are, it's not a matter of if, but it's just when you're going to blow up, blow the account. So just don't forget to manage your risk no matter what. Yeah, yeah. Good advice. And Argento, how can people find you if they want to connect with you or see what you're doing? They can visit the, the website at forexallstars.com or via my Twitter at, at trader underscore Hardy. Or also they can email me at hardy at forexallstars.com. Cool. And we'll make sure to put all the link in the show notes, as always. And Argento, what, what kind of goals do you have for the future? For the future, uh, I'm just going to run the trade copiers. You know, uh, hopefully I can get more customers, more clients. And then also I'm trading Forex market, but in the long term, I think um, mostly I'm just going to be trading and then invest, invest some of my money back into the stock market. Yeah. That's how you, you build wealth to invest the money back for sure. That's right. And what's the motivation to trade every single day and do all that? The main motivation, of course, is my family, you know, my wife and my two children. They're the main reason I keep trading, you know, every day I wake up. So the reason I really want to look at the market and everything is just, I know I'm trading for them. So whatever money I'm making, I know I'm going to use it for them. So they are my main motivation. Great. And Ardiento, we have a question we ask the guests at the end of every podcast. If you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence of advice be? Manage your risk. Love it. Love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Ardiento, thanks so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for having me, Etienne. So that was it for the interview with Ardiento Snoto. I hope you guys liked it. Hope you got some value and especially things to apply as always. All the details are going to be in the show notes as always over at desartotrade.com forward slash 121. If you want to connect with me after the show, check out the Facebook group over at desartotrade.com forward slash group. And I'll see you guys next week for the next episode of the Desartotrade podcast. Ciao.